Let's start with the basics. What is it you're proposing with Senator Coons? So the 301 tariffs that have been put out there have been ignored in many ways. There's been a lot of focus on the 232 tariffs. That deals with steel and aluminum, cars and such. Uh, but the 301 tariffs does with any manufacturing that's happening in China and those products coming in. Uh, there's a 10 percent tariff. The president had threatened a 25 percent tariff to be able to go up uh, from there. But in the first two tranches, which were smaller amounts, uh, there was an exclusion process, a way that uh, companies could say this is not manufactured anywhere else. It has to be done here. Uh, there's no other competition and such. Th those two exclusion processes were put into place and they're working through it. But the third largest tranche uh, of tariffs that are still coming out of these 301s, there's no exclusion process. So you have $200 billion worth of products and no way to do an exclusion, no way to do a waiver process. Chris Coons and I are simply saying we've got to do a waiver process. We put in, a, in place what that waiver process would be and to say you can't just say to American companies you're getting all these $200 billion worth of tariffs on you with no option out of it and no way to even be able to plead your case. Now, as you say, for the first two smaller tranches, there were procedures for exemptions. Right. There weren't for the larger tranche. Uh, it, did, would your legislation just apply to that tranche, or if it became law, would it modify Section 301 of the Trade Act for all purposes when there are future tariffs? It would be for all purposes, for all future tariffs, to be able to make sure that there is an exclusion process in place. This creates some certainty uh, for American manufacturers. Uh, people forget that the engineering is here, the intellectual property is here, uh, the companies that do all the sales, all the marketing distribution, that all happens here in the United States. So there may be manufacturing in China or in Vietnam or in India or in multiple other places around the world, uh, but that the engineering and all the brain power and what's actually happening here with the technology is here. We don't want to hurt those American companies and be able to punish them for what's happening and how they're abiding by the rules uh, long term and in the short term. So that's addressing one aspect of the consequences of Section 301. Let's talk about a different one because that's on the import side. That is basically right. imposing tariffs. People importing here, it affects the consumers here, affects companies that have to use these products. What about on the export side? Because there's some indication actually that our exports have really been curtailed because the Chinese have taken retaliatory action. Is there anything to be done about that? We, we have not. Uh, what we want to be able to do is just identify this one particular issue. Obviously, there's a lot of issues. Soybeans is the clearest of those that, um, you know, we, the, the Chinese are pushing back on soybeans coming into their country. Uh, the, this is a trade issue that does need to be resolved. Uh, and at the end of it, we want to have good trade going both directions. I'm very open to having good trade that's free trade and fair trade. but just creating more um, uh, uh, tariffs on top of American companies doesn't help us in that and pushes retaliatory tariffs. So if we can stop it on this side, we think we can stop the retaliatory tariffs on the other side. Staying on the subject of trade just for a moment, let's talk about Brexit and possible yeah. U.S.-U.K. trade agreements. There's reports out last week about what the United States would be looking for, things like access to agriculture, for example, which is pretty sensitive with the U.K. How do you see that developing as Brexit proceeds? So it's exceptionally important to us. Obviously, the U.K. is a great ally on it. What we cannot have is the U.K. and uh, Europe forms a Brexit deal that locks out every other country in the world, including the United States, from doing a future trade deal. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of pressure for those in the British Parliament to be able to sign a deal uh, that locks them uh, out of uh, a trade negotiation long term with the United States. We want to be able to negotiate on our aerospace, defense products, on our agriculture. We think we can work through the issues like chlorinated chicken and other things that have been an issue uh, to those in the UK. Those are all achievable things that we can do if we can have a trade agreement with them. They're a long-standing ally and a friend. We've worked together for a very long time on a lot of issues. We'd like to work together on a trade agreement, and we hope that there's not a Brexit deal signed that locks out the United States long term. Senator, you're on the Finance Committee, which gets you involved in trade. Obviously, you have a lot of responsibility there. You're also on the Appropriations Committee. There's an issue pending right now, as you know, which is a bill that began in the House, is now coming over to the Senate, to rescind the President's declaration of an emergency to build that wall, to take funds and build that wall without proper appropriations from the Congress. We increasingly see, most recently, Rand Paul, Republican senator, senators from the Republican side apparently siding with that initiative. Where are you on that subject? So there's actually three areas the president's made a request on the Treasury Asset Forfeiture Fund, uh, another fund uh, that's uh, one he has great discretion on in the military to deal with drug interdictions, and then a military construction one. I don't hear any pushback on the first two. Uh, there's about $4.5 billion of the $5.7 billion the president said he wanted to be able to get would be included in those first two. He clearly has legal authority on. The challenge is on the military construction budget to not do those military construction projects and to be able to shift them over. We've yet to see 
see the account numbers on those and what the president's actually looking for and what he's trying to be able to accomplish with it. Our hope would be is that he would focus in the area where he clearly has statutory authority already, uses those funds, it avoids the court uh, cases, which will surely come on it, and avoids setting a precedent long term for any future president uh, to be able to actually try to use an emergency declaration in a different way. It's, it's your hope, but thus far the president's been, I think it's fair to say, pretty steadfast in pursuing what he wants. If, in fact, he sticks to his gun, so to speak, and uh, wants that extra po portion, that is the money that would have been gone for military construction, where will you vote? Well, that, that I've not settled yet at this point. I'm a very strong proponent of border security. I absolutely think this is a national security issue. The best thing that we can do, though, is actually get to the construction. My concern is if he does the long-term uh, piece changing the military construction, it locks up in the courts for two, three years. That construction actually never occurs. So the best thing that we can do is focus on the areas where we know he has statutory authority. Uh, again, that's over $4.5 billion just from those dollar amounts and to get busy on the construction and make sure that we can actually get this done. That's the safest route to make sure that we actually get the, the fencing built. And finally, Senator, you, you also are on the Intelligence Committee, as I understand it. Uh, let's talk about Huawei just for a moment. That is to say, based on what you know, not asking you to reveal any confidential information, but based on what you know, how big a threat is Huawei to the United States, particularly with respect to 5G? So it's not just a threat to the United States, it's a global threat to us. Uh, if uh, Huawei is, as a company is able to have access to telecommunication, everything that goes through your phone, whether it be on an app or whether it be on a phone call or a text, would that the uh, Chinese government would have access to. We think that's a security concern here in the United States. We think most Americans want to be able to protect our privacy and to be able to make sure our privacy is guarded uh, as much as possible. We also would encourage our allies uh, to pay attention to that as well. So this has become a, an international issue, not just a national issue. Telecommunications uh, is the primary access point to all information. If you think the app on your phone has a lot of information, the carrier for that phone and the person who actually carries that signal has infinitely more information about every single person.